Here's another question on forces. The diagram shows stages of an extreme sport called human catapult. Initially, the person is placed in a cradle in position A. There's an elastic rope that has been stretched. The rope is released and the person is launched vertically upwards into the air. Eventually, the person gets really high and then starts to fall back down. So the first question is, explain or describe the energy transfers from position A to B to C. So it helps if we can have this picture in front of us. So let's start with A. What kind of energy does position A have right now? Well, we know that the elastic ropes have been stretched. That means they have elastic potential energy. If you were to release them, they would slingshot the person upwards to position B. In position B, the person has moved up, so they're a little bit higher, and also they're speeding up, they're moving faster. So the energy transfer from A to B is that the kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy has increased. And all of this energy has come from the elastic store. So the elastic store or the elastic potential energy has decreased. <clears throat> so all of that is one mark. Now from B to C, now from B to C, we can see that the person has gone higher. However, we know that when you throw something up, it doesn't get faster. In fact, it slows down because of gravity. Whatever goes up must eventually come down unless you're sending something into orbit. So from B to C, the kinetic energy has decreased because it's slowing down and the gravitational potential energy has increased because it's going higher. That's our second mark. Now for the third mark, we have to think about something that's not visible. So let's see. So we've, now we've explained both, okay, we've explained A to B and B to C, so that's given us two marks. But the question wants one more point. So we have to explain something that we can't see visibly in this diagram. An example could be because of friction. We know that when things are moving, that means friction causes energy to be released in the form of heat. So that means our third mark is going to be some energy is dissipated to the surroundings. Another word for dissipated is released or spread to the surroundings. And that's going to be our third mark. Okay, part B. So let's bring up the picture again. We can see that the question is saying, explain how terminal velocity is achieved. We can see that the question is talking about the parachute stage and in particular how terminal velocity is achieved. Now we know when something's coming down, its velocity will be changing until it gets to a constant speed. This constant speed is also known as a terminal velocity when the speed no longer changes. The reason this happens is because the forces that are pulling down and pushing up, so weight and air resistance, must be balanced. So whenever they're balanced, we get terminal velocity. So for the question, we're going to say that the opposite forces, weight and air resistance, are equal and balanced. So that's one mark. Therefore, there will be no overall force or no resultant force. And that's going to be our second mark. Okay. Part C involves a calculation. So let's get rid of these lines to make things much more neater. We've been given energy, we've been given a spring constant, and we've been asked to work out extension. So to answer the question, we need to know what equation to use. Since we've been given spring constant, we know that we could use this equation, elastic potential energy is equal to half Ke squared, or we could use F equals Ke. Both of those have spring constant. However, the second one has force, and we haven't been given force in the question, which means we're not going to use this one and focus only on this equation. Now that we have the equation, we're going to work out E. So let's rearrange. First of all, we're going to times both sides by two. That gives us two times energy equals Ke squared. Then divide both sides by k, which gives us the following. And finally, square root both sides, so we have e on its own. 
Now to work out extension, all we have to do is plug in the values from the question. So two times 25,000 over 125. And that gives us an extension of 20 meters. Here's another calculation. Again, let's get rid of the lines. So it says calculate the distance between point B and C. So in our picture, we can see that this is point B. The person is moving up at 26 meters per second. By the time they get to point C, they're going to be slowing down. At point C, they have no speed, so they are moving at zero meters per second. We want to work out the distance between point B and C. So if you take 26 as our initial velocity and zero as the final velocity, which we can call U and V respectively, and if you want to work out distance in meters, we could use this equation. V squared minus U squared is equal to two times acceleration times distance. So zero squared take away 26 squared equals two times acceleration times distance. So two is just a number, but we need to work out acceleration. We haven't been given acceleration in the question. So here's something important that you need to know. If something's falling towards earth, it has an acceleration of 9.8. That means if something's moving away from earth, it's going to have the opposite value for acceleration. And this is the value that we're going to use since the person's going upwards. Now all we have to do is rearrange to work out distance. And that gives us a distance of 34.48, which we can round to 34 meters. Okay, moving on to the next question on forces. Here we have two towers made by using wooden blocks. The first question is, what is meant by the term center of mass? So the center of mass is very simple. It's the point where the mass of an object is concentrated. Every single object has a center of mass. But of course, where it will be depends on the object's shape and how tall and wide it is, etc. So moving on to the next question. Let's say we have these two towers and one of them is, of course, more stable. If a wind was to blow, for example, we know which one's more likely to fall over. So give two reasons why figure two is less stable than figure one. Now, one thing to do with stability is to do with center of mass. When something has a low center of mass, it's closer to the earth, and therefore it's less likely for it to fall over. Think about race cars, they're quite low and wide. On the other hand, compare that to a bus, which is quite tall. If a bus was to try and do the same kind of turn that a sports car does, it's gonna fall over, right? So the higher the center of mass, the more likely it is for it to be less stable. So the first part is tower two has a higher center of mass, which makes it less stable. The next thing is comparing the bases. We can see that figure one has a much wider base compared to figure two. Again, that means figure one is more stable. So figure two has a narrower base, making it less stable than figure one. Okay, next part. So here we have two blocks A and B, which have been placed in the same position on opposite sides of the block. The question says, explain why the tower does not fall over and include references to moments in your answer. Now moments is something in triple science. However, if you already got to this part of the video, might as well watch the rest of it. So we can think of this as almost like a seesaw. Now you know what a seesaw is, right? You and your friend sit on opposite sides and your friend pushes it this way, this is called a clockwise moment, and you move it this way, anti-clockwise. Now, if both the moments are balanced, then the seesaw stays where it is, it doesn't move. But imagine if it's just you alone, maybe your friend's gone somewhere. Now, you only have the anti-clockwise moment. The clockwise moment has gone, there is no clockwise moment anymore. So things have become unbalanced. In this scenario, things will begin to move. So, in this question, the fact that it's not moving means that A and B must have equal and opposite moments. So we're going to say anti-clockwise moment caused by... So we're going to say the anti-clockwise moment by A and the clockwise moment by B, which is all, which is all one mock together, by the way, 
are equal. That's your second mark. I hope you clocked that. Hey guys, if that video helped you, support our channel by liking, subscribing, and sharing it with your friends. And more importantly, if you still have questions, drop a post on our forum at examqa.com, where I will personally be there to help answer your questions. Mohammed signing out.